and Sally climbed trees together. They threw snowballs at each other. They yanked each other's hair. They fought and they fussed and they fumed. They spent lots of time together. And then suddenly one day something beautiful happened and it changed their outlook each on the other completely. They fell in love. Brethren and sisters, it is possible to have spent a lot of time with Christ and even having done many things together, but still something is missing. We have not yet fallen in love. How do you learn to love? Learning to love Christ is after all at the very heart of all Christianity. I dare say there's not a person here today who would not raise their hand and say, yes, I want to love Christ more. Would you open your Bibles to the book of 1 John? Way in the back of the New Testament, 1 John. Chapter 4. <clears throat> First John chapter 4 and the 19th verse. And we're going to kind of dissect this short text like the students in the biology lab do sometimes with their frogs and just kind of take it apart and look at its component parts. First John, the fourth chapter and the 19th verse. We love him because he first loved us. That's our central thought for today. We love because he first loved. Let's begin with the first two words, we love. Love is the basis, of course, of all Christianity. Now, we do need to ask ourselves as Christians the question, am I serving the Lord? But today, I'm not asking you if you serve him, but do you love him? It is possible to serve Christ without really loving him for the sake of duty. for the sake of reward. Beautiful young girl is chased by an ugly old dominating man who offers her silk and servants and she marries him. Is she his now? Legally, yes, but she did not really choose him. She chose what he could give her. It is possible for us to follow Christ and even accept marriage to Christ because of what we believe Christ can give us. But do you love him? For three years, Peter followed Jesus. Was at his side for a thousand meals they shared together, praying together, watching all of the miracles that Jesus did working with the other disciples to teach others about the great master for three years. And then after Jesus' death and resurrection in John 21, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? I love you. I've walked by your side for all of these three years. I have left a fishing business. I'm in the ministry with you. I have worked miracles in your name. I believe in you, Lord. But that wasn't the question. Peter, do you love me? And three times Jesus asked that same question. And so it must have been an important question. Is it possible that you or I might have served the Lord lo these many years and not yet really have learned to love him very much? Peter did. 
And just as certainly as the Lord came to Peter, he comes to your seat and he asks you this morning, do you love me? Of course, Lord. I come to church every week, maybe even prayer meeting. Lord, I would lose my job for you. Lord, I would even go to jail for you. Lord, I'd do anything for you. I would even give my life as a martyr for you. But do you love me? Love, you see, is other-centeredness. There are two poles in the moral world, self-centeredness and other-centeredness. And if we serve Christ for what self can get out of it, we cannot be serving him out of love. Who wants to go to that hot place when he dies anyway? Who would consciously opt for eternal death? Surely anything is better than that. Lord, I will serve you. But fear does not help me love him. Love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. That's from Desire of Ages, page 3. Love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. That sadly is the reason why so many Seventh-day Adventist young people can grow up in a Seventh-day Adventist home and attend Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath school and church services and go to a Seventh-day Adventist church school and live in a Seventh-day Adventist dormitory and wind up not loving Christ. Because you can make a child go to worship, but you cannot command a child to love Christ. You can make a person act lovingly, but you cannot command a person to love Christ. And the problem with many of us as highly respectable church-going Seventh-day Adventists, it's so difficult for a person who has been taught to act lovingly all of their lives to understand that he doesn't love. Because everybody who believes in love would like to think that he is able to love. Brother and sister, it ain't necessarily so. Back to our text. We love him because he first loved us. Let me put just three of those words together. We love because. Human love loves because. Natural love has to have a reason for loving. And love that needs a reason is very imperfect love. Actually, our attitudes toward other people tend to be quite a direct reflection of what we think their attitudes are toward us, right? I find it quite easy to love the people that I think love me. I even have the greatest respect for the judgment of people who think that I'm a good person. Anybody that can think that clearly just can't be wrong about that many things then our love tends very much to be a reflection of how another person treats us. Didn't you think once that you were madly in love with somebody who decided that they were not in love with you? And when they stopped treating you in a loving way, you decided that they just weren't all that lovable after all. Human beings have a strong tendency to love because... We have to have a reason for loving. And that's what our text says. We love because. Now Christ, on the other hand, loves us not because of what we are, but because of who he is. Christ loves us because he is love. 1 John 4, 8, the same chapter, God is love. He is love. Beautiful text over just a few pages. You want to turn with me? Let's keep your place here in 1 John. Revelation, the first chapter, 
and the fifth verse. Revelation, the first chapter and the fifth verse. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Some manuscripts suggest loosed us from our sins or freed us from our sins. But the Jerusalem Bible agrees with the King James, and it's so much more dramatic, I think. Unto him that loved us and washed us. Take a very, very careful look at the order of that verse. What does Christ do first, love us or wash us? Christ loves us first, and he washes us only because he already loved us. Now, I don't know about your kids, but our seven when they were small, and now it's with the younger grandkids. When they get through a meal, you could tell what they had for dinner without ever looking at the plate. You look at their face, kind of a face and hands, there's kind of a whole menu written there, right? If it wasn't on the face, it was on the hair, the hands, maybe all the way up to the elbow. Dinner's over and daddy gets up from the table and baby reaches out those hands, those grimy hands. Now what do you do? You love the little rascal. You'd really rather he was cleaned up before he got jam on your white shirt. He might get me dirty. Oh, but that's not the way Jesus loves. Oh, how mixed up to presume that I've got to get cleaned up before he will accept me. Our text says that he loved us and he washed us from our sins. He loved us when we were dirty and he washed us because he loved us already. We see that in a beautiful story of the prodigal son, how he had degraded to the point where all of his money had run out and all he could find for his job was feeding the pigs and wishing he would eat their food. And he must have come when he decided to come to his father smelling awful, looking awful, rags, filthy, smelly, stinking, just a horrible wretch of a human being. And his father was still looking for him. And he looked and he saw him a long way off and went running toward him. And he didn't say, hey, head in there, there's a shower waiting for you. And then we'll talk. He embraced his son and he hugged him and he kissed him and he put his own garment around him and he said, welcome back home. That's the kind of God we serve. I would like to suggest today four rungs on the ladder to perfect love. We've been saying that Christ has a perfect love, but human love loves only because of. How do you get from where we are by nature to where Christ is? As we look for a few moments at these four rungs on the ladder leading to perfect love, I want you to ask yourself a very personal and a very significant question. Which rung am I standing on today? I would hope there's not one person here but that has walked up to at least the first rung of the ladder. Which rung of the ladder do you stand on today? Four rungs on the ladder to perfect love. Rung number one is to realize that God loves you. We love him because he first loved us. He loved us and he washed us. He loves you just as you are. You cannot make God stop loving you. The skeptic stood up before the audience in the park 
And he announced to everybody that could hear his voice, he said, there is no God. I can prove it. If there is a God, I dare you, God, to strike me dead in five minutes. Pretty rash, pretty bold. The crowd hushed, such blatant blasphemy. God, I dare you to prove that you exist. Strike me dead, five minutes. And he took out his watch, and the seconds began to tick. One minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. Nothing happened. Ladies and gentlemen, proof positive, there is no God. Whereupon a little old lady pushed her way through the crowd. She said, sir, may I ask you a question? You have children, right? Yes, I have a son. If your son handed you a butcher knife and he challenged you to prove your strength by plunging that knife into his body, would you do it? Well, of course not, don't be silly. I love my children. Of course you do, she said. And that's exactly the way God feels about you. He loves you and he wants you saved for eternity. And so we need to realize rung number one that he loves you whether you love him or not. He loves you just as you are First comes love, and then comes loveliness. Mount of Blessings, page 39. He does not ask us if we are worthy of his love, but he gives us his love to make us what? He gives us his love to make us worthy. His righteousness, not ours. And so the first rung of the ladder is to realize and accept the fact that Christ loves you warts and all. He accepts you without any recommendation whatsoever. You are loved. One of the things I enjoy about a wedding is that all weddings are presided over by beautiful brides. Have you noticed that? I've known some plain girls that have gotten married, but I have never known a plain bride. Even the most haphazard, misshapen, awkward, plain girl is beautiful as a bride. Why? Is it the dress and the flowers and all of that? That's part of it. But the main reason, I think, because when we know that we are loved, it makes us lovely. It makes us glow. We respond to love in a beautiful way. And so God loves us misshapen, sin-scarred and all, and it's loving us just as we are that makes us beautiful. And the problem of so many commandment-keeping Christians is that they're so disgustingly respectable, they have a strong tendency to think that they've done something worth being loved for. And when you think that you deserve to be loved, the heart goes out of your entire Christian experience. The joy doesn't come into Christianity until you realize that God is treating you so much differently from the way you deserve. And when you think that you deserve God, you neither deserve him nor know him. And so the first rung is to accept the fact that God loves you as you are without any recommendation. You cannot do anything to make God stop loving you. And you cannot, dear Seventh-day Adventist Christian, ever do one thing to make God love you any more than he does right now. He loves you. God doesn't love you any more than he does the drunk down in the gutter. Until we begin with that basic theology, we will never appreciate and love God for who he is. God is love. Rung number two, very closely associated. We let this undeserved love waken within us a love for him. 
realizing that we don't deserve his love, and yet we are loved, love begets love. And there begins to be a new understanding of what God is. You see, that's really the basic difference between the pagan and the Christian. The pagan and the Christian both worship in their own ways, but the pagan worships to keep God from doing something bad to him, or he, he needs to do things in order to win the favor of the gods. It's all about doing. What must I do? But the Christian worships because God has already done something good for him. Done instead of do. God has already done it for us. God has loved that Christian. God accepts that Christian. First of all, we accept God's love just as we are. And secondly, this begins to fill our hearts with love for God who has treated us so differently from what we deserve. We love him because he first loved us. And now thirdly, the love started with God, God loving us. Now we have reciprocated and we love God back. We respond to his love. Now step number three, we love our brethren. 1 John 4, verse 21. 1 John 4, 21. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, as we just said, now loves his brother also. We're not at the top rung yet, but we love the, our Christian brethren because we love the Christ that is in them. There's a law, you know, in mathematics that things equal to the same thing are equal to one another. You probably had to memorize that in math class. Things equal to the same thing are then equal to each other. Called the transitive property. If A equals B and B equals C, then A is also equal to C. Very simple concept. Now you have to use your imagination. We used to have pews here instead of these chairs. And the pews were made out of the same kind of wood that is the pulpit is made out of. Oak, I believe. And if the pew there was the same kind of wood that was in the pulpit, and a pew over there was in the same was the same kind of wood that the pulpit was made of, maybe out of the same tree, who knows? Then those two pews then both have the same kind of wood, the transitive property. The pulpit represents Christ. The pews represent two brethren in the church. And this man's acceptance and indwelling of Christ, and this man's indwelling of Christ, those makes those two people a great deal alike. They have a tremendous thing in common. They share a mutual love for Christ. It's a bit like in a marriage, in an ideal situation, you would have the husband and the wife down here and Christ would be up here. And as the husband develops his relationship and that becomes the important, most important relationship in his life is a relationship with God. And the wife has that same goal to get closer and closer to Christ. As they do get closer and closer to Christ, they get closer and closer to each other. And as we in the church all aim in our personal walk with Christ to get closer and closer and develop that relationship, we become closer to each other. And so now we come to the fourth step, the most difficult step. First of all, Christ loves us no matter what. This no matter what is especially the thing that makes us love him. And when we love him, then it's easy for us to love him, to love the good, to love the Christ in our fellow man, in our fellow Christian. Now, brethren, some of us are stuck on the third rung of the ladder. We enjoy Christian fellowship. We enjoy loving relationships. But this isn't where the Lord wants to leave us today. 
Not at all. The fourth rung of the ladder is that next we love the unlovely because that's how he loved us. And we want to be more like Christ. You know, it's not so difficult being on the third rung of the ladder, loving the people who think like me or who might agree with me or who share a love for Christ with me. The final test of love is whether we are able to love the unlovely. And what is it that makes us love the unlovely? Because Christ loved me that way. And if Christ loved me, the unlovely, the sinful me, then as I become like Christ, I will surely learn to love the unlovely too. Please turn with me to the Gospel of John. We've been reading the words of John and 1 John. Let's go back to John's Gospel, the 15th chapter. John chapter 15, the 12th verse. And maybe you've never thought of this verse in quite this light before. John the 15th chapter and the 12th verse. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. That's saying more than just I loved you and so you should love other people. It says more than that. It says I loved you in a certain way. I loved you in an undeserving way and you ought to love others in an undeserving way also. Look at it again, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you in the same way that I have loved you. Verse 13 kind of explains what that love looks like. Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. And I don't think that's talking about just giving your physical life for the sake of a friend. It's turning aside your way of life, your way of living, being to interrupt what's important in your life to help somebody else, to think of somebody else, to love somebody else that maybe is undeserving of your love. That's giving your life for a friend. Our natural tendency is that if that person will just stop talking about me and dragging my name in the dirt. If he'll just start being nice to me, I could love him. If he just makes some changes in his life, I could love him. I believe, Brother Spooner, that I could love my wife if she'd only make some changes in the way she treats me and the things she does for me. Or he needs to change the flaws in his character before I can really love him. There's not much Christianity in that, folks. If you can't love a person, it isn't because he's bad, it's because your love is bad. And when you're unable to love a person, it's a much greater condemnation of your Christianity than it is of his character. We need to stop excusing our lack of love on the fact that there are just bad people out there. The problem is we've got bad love in us. Let me suggest a test for love. The way to really test your Christian love is how you feel toward the person that you think is the most unlovely, unlovely person that you've known. How do you really feel toward the most unlovely person that you know? When you're able to answer that, you'll know something about which rung of the ladder you're standing on. And so let's put it all together. How can I turn my life around? How can I turn my life into a truly love-centered, other-centered life? That's what we all want. We want it so much that we pretend we have it. We fake it. But way down deep, we know we're not really, we haven't really learned to love the way we know we ought to. 
How does it happen? Four rungs on the ladder leading to perfect love. First of all, I accept Christ loving me when I have done nothing to deserve it. Secondly, this makes me want to love the one who treats me so better than I deserve. Thirdly, since I now love Christ, I find it quite easy and natural to love other people that love Christ because the Christ in me and the Christ in them reach out in unity as we come closer to Christ. But step four is that now I am able to love even the unlovely because that's the way Jesus loves me. Some years ago, a little girl came down sick, very sick. Matter of fact, they had to quarantine her. She was highly contagious. And she had a very close girlfriend, but of course they couldn't see each other. She was quarantined. Days went by, weeks went by. The little sick girl never heard a thing from her friend. Finally, she started to get well and they could be together again in the same room. She was pretty aggravated right off the bat with her friends. She said, you could at least have sent me one little note or something, some cards, flowers, something. Oh, but I did. I sent you something out of love every single day that you were in the hospital. Every single day I remembered you. I never got it once. Oh. You see, I send it to you through somebody else. I guess they just kept it for themselves. There's not a single heart in this congregation today that has received and received and received love from our Lord. But how many of us are really passing it on? How many of us have taken and taken and taken Christ's love and we're depriving people in our own families of love? We've taken and taken and taken Christ's love and we neglect others in our church family. We've taken and taken and taken Christ's love and we're letting people in our community go loveless all through the year because we take and we take and we don't pass it on. Is there somebody that God wants to love through you? Maybe somebody that you found too unlovely to go very far out of your way to love. As we close our service today, will you ask the Lord, which rung of the ladder do I stand on? Lord, whom have you wanted to love through me? Shall we pray? Loving Father, silently we have lifted our minds heavenward. We've asked you to show us our love limitations. Thank you for showing us how we can learn to love more. Send us away today with that experience. Today, we pray, in our community, in our church, and maybe even in our own families or people who are reaching out for love. Love that you have perhaps sent to them through us and we haven't passed it on. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to be willing to go as far out of our way to love them as Jesus was willing to come here out of heaven to love us. May we do a great turnaround not only as individuals but as a church that there might not be one unloved person among us. Thank you for speaking to our hearts today. Take us safely to our homes and send us out to do your work this week, to love even the unlovely. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.